what the place looked like when we bought it in 1995. In 1995? Yes. Uh, and well, we haven't been here since then, have we? No. There was a very little glass in the windows, big holes in the roof, termites ate it all up. Shortly after we bought it, part the foundation collapsed. We bought it from the Wees family. Their grandfather was the miller here from 1938 until he passed away. He passed away and he was German, had a thick German accent. He was trained in Germany as a miller, came to the United States, worked with three different mills. Uh, he worked here from 1938 until 41. And then him and Mildred bought the place in 1941. He ran it until 1985 and he passed away. And then their son, Bob Weiss, ran it from 85 to 91. Now at that point, they had a big mill up in Rockville where they was making their money. They made feed, milled and sold plants and stuff. Um, but they kept this open. Mildred lived right across the road. And they kept this open for like school tours, bus tours. Um, you want me to do it? And to, uh, they were still doing uh, uh, rye flour, buckwheat flour, and pastry flour. They were doing white cornmeal and yellow cornmeal, and then they were doing a buckwheat pancake mix, a cornbread mix, and a fish batter. It wasn't much of a business, but they were in business. Miller was doing somewhere between three and 5,000 pounds a year after Bob passed away in 91. I think I may have missed that. But he got cancer and died suddenly in 91. Then Miller and the grandkids, grandkids are about my age, ran it from 92, 3, 94. She broke her ankle. That's when they put the place up for sale. And that's when I saw it for sale. And it looked wow. like this. So you're going for punishment. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I made an offer on the site. I've been seeing. I've been coming here since the '70s. I just kind of fell in love with this site. And I stopped by in '94 just to see the old mill. And there was a for sale sign nailed to the building. The uh, door was open. I came inside. It was actually running that day, which was a little unusual. And I said, "Now this place is not for sale." They go, "Oh yeah, it's for sale." And I said, "Well, how much land goes with it?" And they said, four to ten acres." I said, well, what does that mean, four to ten acres? And they said, well, Grandpa got it back in the 30s, and we don't know where the property lines are at. I said, well, don't you have a survey? No. I said, do you have a real estate agent? No. So I said, can you take me around and show me? So they took me around, and they were actually pretty close. And I said, how much you asking for? And they told me I went outside, looked around, come back in, and I said, I'll take it. And they said, you're kidding. I said, no, I want to buy it. I said, everybody's making fun of us. I say it's too much. And I said, well, I think it's cheap, and I want to buy it. So I made an offer right then uh, on contract, and several times I made. This is my wonderful wife. Hi. So put up with me. I am Karen. Well, Karen, <laughs> I heard you hurt your ankle. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know what I did. Something with my knee. I think I twisted it earlier. Uh, okay. But I, we're here. <laughs> it's nice. That's great. That's right. I'm so excited to be here. What a good deal. Oh, Very yeah. nice to meet you. Yeah, you all right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I made several offers on contract and they kept turning me down. I finally offered them even more money and they said, well, why are you offering us more money? I said, well, I don't want to go to the bank. I just want to buy it from you folks on contract. But they said they didn't want anything to do with the contract. So we went to the bank and they took my wife and I in the back room and they gave us a lecture on being stupid and throwing your money away. See, I made the mistake of taking a picture of the mill with me. This is what it looked like. You can see there's just big holes in it. Wow. Uh, the windows are all, almost all the windows were boarded up, plastic over. Wow. So we went to a that? different bank, and they were interested, but they wanted to survey. So I went to Mildred, and she says, you get somebody, I'll pay for it. So it took two months to do the survey. This place hadn't been surveyed since 1818. That's when they got the original 200 acres. They, had, they spent almost all the time in the courthouse tracking down all the changes of ownership. And we ended up with about five and a half acres. And uh, so then they wanted a contract with, would you like a chair or something? Okay. Okay. They wanted a contract, they wanted this, they wanted that. They just kept throwing obstacles in front of us. And about eight months had passed by. Well, I went to the bank and I said, look, you're wasting my time. You're wasting Mildred's money. You know, if, if you don't want to loan me money, just say so. So they had a little huddle and they said, well, we've decided to loan you the money, but we want 30% down. It's high risk. I said, that's $72,000. You people are out of friggin' mind. Said, Who the heck's got $72,000? Well, my wife drags me out of the office. I said, let's go see Mildred. Because over the eight months, Mildred told me that there were people from Fort Wayne looking at this as a bed and breakfast. And some other people were talking about like, maybe arts and crafts or a restaurant. And I can I pretty much tell she didn't want them people to buy it. Now, see, I was really wanting a water-powered cabinet shop because I had a little cabinet shop. 
And I thought, wow, water powered cabin shop, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. But I knew Miller wouldn't sell it to her. So I went to see Miller, and she says, well, what now? Because we just kept throwing these obstacles. And I said, they decided to lose the money. She said, well, it's about time. I said, yeah, but they want 30% now. And she said, my God, that's $72,000. I said, you got that kind of money? I said, there's no way, Mildred. She says, what are we going to do? I said, the only thing I can think of is if you give me half of it, I promise you, we're going to save that old mill, we're going to restore it, and we're going to carry on. She said, Michael, I want you to have the mill because I know you're going to do good. And she wrote us a check for $36,000 and we were able to buy it. Wow. But then the family wouldn't give me the keys. And I said, well, what's going on? And they said, we're going to teach you how to run this place. I didn't, I didn't ask again. I said, well, that's a good idea. So <laughs> we owned the place for about three days. They taught me how to do the maintenance, the milling, and their grandfather's recipes. Yeah. And then they gave the keys to me. And then in the beginning, they come in once a while and check on me. Sure. I promised Grandma's going to carry on. And they they all grew up in this business, you know. They were yeah. very proud. One so, of the, one so, of the so how long was the maintenance? How long did it take you? Actually, just one day. Oh, they really? said, we'll meet you out there Saturday. And it was just one day. Yeah, it was late. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Baptismal fire. Yes. And oh. I said, we're going to put some corn in it. And, no, we're going downstairs. So we went downstairs and we, we did the That's the easy work. part, right? Yeah. And we come back upstairs. <laughs> we're going to put corn in it. No, we're going upstairs. <laughs> you know, we come back downstairs. I said, we're going to put corn in it. said, no, we're going to take it apart. So we tore it all apart, cleaned everything, put it all back together. And I said, oh, we're going to put some corn in it. They said, yeah, now we're going to put corn in it. So we was grinding, stopping, so starting. Pleased. Yeah, and, and we was you know stopping and starting and, and and doing this and that, and they were talking about Grandpa and the sifting and the proper order of the sifting and everything, you know. And then they all come down. It was about oh, I'd say eight of them, and they were standing right here. I was up there by myself. And I thought, what, what were they doing now? And about that time, it ran out of corn. And the two stoves started rubbing together. Wow, wow. raised it up real quick and shut it off. They said, you're going to be a pretty good man. And they all walked by and handed me the keys and out they went. Out they went, uh. while, we were, while we were grinding, can I help you, ma'am? Just whenever you're ready to take some ice cream and some stuff down there, Is I got kids. Wife, out there? My wife should be. Oh my goodness, there's a pile of people out there waiting. Karen Jane! While we were grinding, you know, uh, there were some people knocking on the door. So I come over here and, and Door. They said, don't open that door. I said, why not? They said, that's just a bunch of strangers out there. They got no business in here. <laughs> now, during the festivals and uh, school tours, oh, they showed off. I was off. one of those people. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> okay. Really? Uh huh. Because that's why Mike and I have been here. Uh, we did a book on covered bridges years ago, but we'd been here a second time, but we weren't allowed in. Right. Am I okay. correct? Well, yeah. So that might be what's going on there. Well, it was a dangerous place. Oh, yeah. You know, back in the oh, day, all the flat belts and machinery and all this stuff. People couldn't just come in. And then, you know, this is an old Dutch door. They shut the bottom, let the air come in, but, you know, the bottom door was shut. Yeah. So it keeps the dogs and kids and people out of here. Right. If you want to do some business, they come How in. How fascinating. Yeah. And then... Well, uh, you have done some marvelous work. So we, we bought it, and then the, they showed me how to run it. And this is right at six wow. months, part yeah. of the foundation collapsed on the building. Six months. Yeah. Uh, we come up here, my youngest son and I, and the scales was missing. I thought, somebody stole the scales because they were still breaking the windows out and stuff, you know. Oh. And I looked at the hole. Oh my God. So we go downstairs, the foundation had fallen Fall in, in, the scales fell in the hole. So I said, oh my God. So I had some people jump in, they helped me, and we just, we tore, of course it was terrible shape anyway, we tore it off. Back cement truck up there just you know, built for cement, saved the building. Wow. Yeah. So then we called up, I called up newspapers and TV. Historic property changes hands. They said, well, thanks for calling, but we never heard of this place. So I called up the Historical Society and uh, they said, where at? Never heard of it. And I, so I told them what little I knew and they accused me a building, a brand new building here, and trying to fool the public. Told me I'll be ashamed of myself. <laughs> and I said, well, what on earth makes you think it's a brand new building? Well, sir, it's not in my computer. I said, well, that proves it. And she uh, hung up on me. Wow. We bought it in June of 95. We got the plaque in June of 97. Now, I called, you know, one guy called me back, Indianapolis News, which used to be the evening paper. Yeah, and he yeah. says, I've talked to the historical side, I've talked to, nobody's heard of this place. Are you sure it's there? I said, I'm standing it. Oh, oh, oh yeah. He said, what are you doing Saturday? I said, well, I'm hoping I'm talking to you. So he comes out and meets me and he goes, wow. He says, can I use your phone? I said, we out? He says, I'm going to call a photographer. So 
so we showed him around, you know, and then the photographer shows up, they take lots of pictures. When they left, I said, I hope, hope I get a nice article, because I can really use some advertisement. He says, oh, I think you'll be pleased. It was almost the full front page of the Indianapolis News. Wow. Well, about three, four weeks later, a bus pulls in. It's the Historical Society. I got a hand to them. They came out here to investigate. Turns out they had lots of information about this building and business. But as far as they knew, it was gone. They had no idea it was still standing yeah. and running. And that, they, they interviewed people around here. They went to Robertsville, Vincennes, did a lot of research, and came back with the plaque. They did recognize it as a centennial business, which is continuous operation for over 100 years. Right. So then I found this other organization that has the oldest business, second, third, and fourth. Well, I believe this is the second oldest continually operating business in Indiana. So I called them up, and the lady just laughed at me. And I said, well, what's wrong? And she says, well, think about it. The list was started in 1968. Any business started after that would be too new. I said, but what if you missed one? She said, well, that's impossible. And I'm busy. She hung up on it. So it's never been plugged in. Uh, I got some nasty phone calls. Number five does not want to be bumped to number six. <laughs> so he's looking forward to being number four, not but backwards. All so right. I said, not important, just forget it, you know. So I never, never pursued that. So we were starting to get traffic, and I, I, was, I was really working hard to get lots of newspaper articles, and I got little magazine articles, and we were starting to get lots of traffic, and the people right here, I think, got their moods out of trouble. So they convinced the county commissioners there was a street running through here, and we were stealing it from the county. They, they, the commissioners sent me a letter and told me to stay off their street. They were going to make improvements. The guy in town says they're going to fence you off and try to stop you from restoring the mill. So I told the commissioners they could take their new street and shove up their, you know, and, well, they sued us. And it took almost three years and thousands of dollars to prove that was just a parking lot. Wow. We countersued them, but... Uh, their elected officials and we get a dollar. So we started making the payments then uh, to the lawyers and our business was growing and we were doing better and we were slowly putting glass in the windows and people knocked it out about as fast as we put it in. So we had to go to an acrylic, a bullet resistant plexiglass. We were almost done. This building, single pane of glass, there's over 500 in the building. I had three more windows to go. And one of the idiots sets the cover bridge on fire, it falls in the creek and melts all the acrylic windows on this side that are falling out of the building. It's an absolute miracle this building didn't burn. Yeah. So then me and hundreds of other people all jumped in, very popular bridge. Um, and a lot of people started donating money and everything. And there's nearly 300 trees in that bridge everyone else is building. They're some of the most wonderful people you've ever met around here. You know, but there's just that element. We can build against the grease kind of thing. So, less than two years, we got the bridge back up. This is the new bridge. It's a copy of the old bridge, and it didn't cost the county a dime. Uh, right at the end of so this. So, that is a new bridge? Yeah, 2006. I saw the date on there. I was yeah. wondering what that yeah. was all about. Uh, there was a guy in prison for arson, got out on good behavior. I am shocked. On, yeah. Uh, but they got it back up, and then right at the end of that, we made the last payments to the lawyer. So I told my wife, see the cover bridge is gone, and they put a temporary road into our mill pond. Of course, when I came here, there was no mill pond. There was no waterfall, there was no mill pond, and this was an ugly old building all to be torn down. But by this time, I had the commissioner, since, mainly since I beat him at the court, that this was a mill pond. So we signed some papers that they could put the temporary road in for the bridge, as long as they took it out when they got done. Well, I'm upstairs repairing a window, and I'm looking down, and I'm thinking, of course, there's no mill pond anyway, it's completely full of dirt. Uh, that's the driest I've ever seen. So I told my wife, I said, we got to start on that dam now. We had looked into getting a grant, and there was a possibility of us getting a matching grant, which is half. But the estimate was 750000 Half of that's ridiculous. So I figured out a way we could do it ourselves by staring out that window and doing what I call pondering. And one day, you know, how am I going to move that dirt and build a temporary dam and, and do this? Look out. The dirt is a dam. And a lot of people would stop by and they said, this, this won't work. You, you can't do that. But if you start, here's my phone number. So I called them up. I said, look, there's a drought. The, the, the milk pond's completely dry. And they showed up. What are we going to do? I said, we're going to dig this out. We're going to pressure wash this. We're going to form it, pour it, get out of the creek before it starts raining. Now there's a gate here, two feet wide by four feet. Now that's at the very bottom. 
and that's like a washout gate. During low water, I can open that up and drain the milk on down like a bathtub. Yeah. So we restore that and I put an electric gate on it. So then the next year, during a drought, we diverted the water to the seeping through here and did the next section. Uh, right in here, the dam inspector shows up and he, the dam inspector loved this place and he kept everybody away from me. The DNR, Division of Water, Corps, everybody. <laughs> I said, hey, do you, do you know Mr. Robert Gray? I said, here's his phone number. And they just left me alone. And that if it wasn't for Mr. Robert Gray, I would have never got this done. Okay. Right here, uh, he shows up and says, Mike, they've changed the water rights. I said, oh, no. He said, oh, it's a good thing for you. You could have a farm tractor in the creek because you've got grandfather water rights. I said, oh, oh. Well, we did all this by hand. The lady from the governor's office told me I, anything I carry, I can use. Well, my gosh, you had to carry it in and carry it back because they'd steal it if you didn't. So we bought this, uh, and we're still making Wait, payments. So that was a big help after that. Uh, there's Dave Gayheimer, he's retired from Rose Hallman, lives up the road here. He's a big help to him. Uh, and these folks here, they remembered the mill pond and they wanted to see it come back and the waterfall. They raised almost $5,000 for us. Um, I call them the damn old ladies. Uh, they helped me anyway. Um, Seba there owns half of the valley. Uh, he's got big tractors. And I, I've had this thing buried twice in the creek and he's pulled me out. Plus big logs back in the tail range back here, which was completely full. We had to clear it out. Some of the logs are bigger than my tractor soaking wet. So Seba would come down with the big tractor and pull the big logs out for me. Um, so we got this done, got it poured. And then the next year, during a drought, we started working on the foundation of the mill. Now the family had sealed this off with concrete after a big dust explosion. 1951 blew the other building off and destroyed the water power and they let everything go. Well they sealed this off with concrete and it silted in. So we had this dug out and then I was going to bust it open. I rented some equipment and I gave up. I got about 20 inches and gave up. So I had this guy come out with this thing and he finished it. It's four feet thick, six and a half by six. And uh, there's Cinnamon and Jacob, they're running around here somewhere. And I got stainless steel plate put on there, seven by seven, as a gate and a chain hoist. And we rebuilt the walkway and the trash rack. That board's about this far apart and catches the sticks. As a matter of fact, I need to go down and clean the trash rack off. So we have this ready to go. Um, and I also restored a gate here, which is a 12 inch. And that keeps the water moving so it doesn't silt back in, hopefully. So now I have three gates, one, two, three. Um, but then I noticed while I was trying to flush the water where it wasn't going anywhere. Well, the head race is where it goes in. Tail race is where it comes out. The creek actually goes around like this, but the miller, about 200 years ago, had cut a straight path for the exhaust, I call it. And that was completely full. Six to eight feet of dirt, lots of trees buried like that. So we got back here, that's when I bought the little backhoe for my tractor, and started pulling the trees out, and then we opened the gates and flush. We shut the gates and dig out more trees. And we just kept doing that until we got the water moving. Now if you look out there now, to the left, you'll see there's like an island. On this yeah, side, right, it's right. 50 or 60 feet wide. Right. Well, it looked like that when I bought the place. Oh. So now we're ready to go. So we waited uh, until the drought, 2009. Called up my friends and they said, what are we gonna do? I said, we're gonna open that gate, this gate, this gate. We're gonna move the creek over here. They said, that's not gonna work. I said, it has to. How are we going to do it? And I said, we're going to dig trenches in here and let Mother Nature and this way, upstream and this way. And Mother Nature starts forcing water through there. And first thing you know, the creek moved over here. Yeah. Almost all of it. Because the turbine pit, if you get tired of me talking, you can raise your hands. I won't quit talking, but that gives you permission to leave. The yeah. turbine pit, that's where the uh, water wheel set, is three feet above the bedrock. So the bottom of this gate, is three feet above the bedrock. Now this gate is at the very bottom, but it wasn't enough to pull all the water over here. I still had a little bit of water. So it was, by now, I had this way, this way, and this way, so I had like an island out there. And I had my tractor, and I was kind of turning that island to shut that side off. Well, that's when the doo-doo hit the fan. The DNR shows up and says, you got to stop. I said, I don't have to stop. The dam inspector says, I can read maintenance. Maintain what you have anytime I want. I don't need your permission. I can't change anything, but I have the right to maintain it. He says, we've got too many complaints. He said, there's so many phone calls going to Indianapolis. They got the phone lines plugged. 
and we can't do anything. You've got to stop. So I called up the Division of Water, and I said, what's going on? And they said, well, they said the phone lines are plugged. They say you're going to flood the town. I said, the dam's been there 200 years. These people are nuts. And he says, well, you can do this, but you have to have a permit. And I, I said, I don't have six, eight months to wait for a permit. I've got, where am I at? Reebok in the dam. I've got a drought. I've got all these volunteers, and I, I, I can't stop. I have to finish it. Some kid's going to get killed on that because it's six, eight months for a, for a permit. And they said, okay, you can finish the dam, but no more excavating. So I come out, and I told Jimmy. Now, he's a foreman for Midwest Pumping. They're pumping the concrete out to us. And he says, I, I can't put concrete on top of the water that's leaking because it'll build up pressure and blow out. And I said, well, you just keep working down here. I'm going to fix it. So I come up here, and I'm looking around, and I found some scrap pieces of pipe. So that's me jamming a piece of pipe in the hole. So Charlie, Carl, and a bunch of other people showed up. What are you doing? So they brought me pipe. We had two or three truckloads of pipe used, scrap pipe. And there was a, about 12 of us, and we stuck a whole bunch of pipes in the dam through here. And then Jimmy come down and started blowing concrete around the pipes, and we finished it. About four and a half years. And when the water's lower, you can actually still see the pipes sticking out. The pipes relieve the pressure for you then? Yeah. 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 And some of them are still running, some of them sells it in. Uh, so, uh, we did it for a little over $50,000. We had to borrow money against our house. And I've got, I've got one of those uh, wives. She wants the house paid off before I move forward, see. We were doing pretty good. We got about half of it paid off. A tornado hit us and blew the roof off the building. Uh, blew more windows out. And the tail race had over 200 trees in it. They were just lined up like this. You could walk from tree to tree above the water. And it completely shut the water off. I said, oh my God, you know. So we had good insurance, but we were down. And I had people showing up because I have uh, chainsaw parties. We have big long jams. I have a chainsaw party. A bunch of people show up with chainsaws and tractors. And then we have like a pitch in dinner and then we finish the job. We cleared uh, nearly, oh, well, over 200 trees in two days. Had seven bonfires. Uh, there's the wife, my oldest son, Chris, uh, working at the ceiling back there, completely caved in. Uh, all the machinery was running, everything in here was running. Because the roof was gone and it kept raining almost every day for four weeks. So we recovered from that and now we're back on track trying to get this paid off. Uh, once we get that paid off, we're going to fix the water power. Uh, and live happily ever after. You have to have falling water to spin the wheel. So we had to fix the dam. It's nine feet tall, 200 feet long. That was back with the turbine or you're with the water wheel? I don't know yet. I, I'm all, I want to get maximum horsepower with something that I can afford. Uh, and that, that's uh, pretty much where we're at. It was a wooden dam originally, uh, 1913. Uh, a guy named P.T. Winnie bought the mill, well, 1906, and he put in two generators, started producing electricity for the mill, lights in the covered bridge in downtown Bridgeton. But he needed more horsepower. So right here, there's P.T. Winnie. He poured concrete over top of the old wood dam, raised it from 8 feet up to 9 feet, gave him more head and more horsepower. It's 10 foot thick at the base, 9 feet tall, and he got about 3 fourths of the way across, had a massive heart attack and died. I think I know why. <laughs> Horse drawn cement makes sure it will on this. Well, my goal was to restore it and not die. Uh, the new owners finished the dam in 1960, three years later, but they did not keep up the power plant. Over here, when we bought the place, this photograph is on post, which is a copy of that one. Uh, there's P.T. Winnie pouring the concrete. Now, when I got it restored, that's me and all my volunteers. Uh, up here, when we restored the dam in uh, 2009. Now this started uh, whoops, sorry. Sorry. No, no. in uh, 1809. We drew a line across the state called the Treaty of Fort Wayne. Well, and told the Indians they had to move north of that line. Well, the Indians to come to them like that. He sent a band of Indians down, they attacked the surveyors and threw all their equipment to the other Well, General Harrison came up and had a meeting with the Indians. 10 o'clock in the morning, he stuck his sword around and made a shadow. So the Indians, you know, all you Indians got moved north of that shadow. Well, there was a, a big battle with the Indians lost. 
on. Tecumseh joined the British because he hated us and fought against us with the British. Well, they changed the British up into Canada and Tecumseh got killed up there somewhere. And then in 1818, they opened this up for seven. And that's when two guys walked along the creek looking for power. And they picked this spot, got 200 acres. They petitioned for a road. The county would build them a road because mills were important to build. They dammed up the creek and started milling. People started working near the mill and the road. Now, if you go out of town this way, you go about two blocks, the road turns to the left. The reason is you're just off of the miller's original 200 acres, and there was a big horse racing track out there for about 75 years. There was lots of gambling. There were 10 or 12 saloons, and there were two or three hotels run by women. Very wicked place, but it did not have a name. People start calling it Sodom. For 25 years, that was the name of this place, was Sodom. Sodom? Sodom, Sodom, yeah. Yeah, great. Like so, Sodom. 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 Yeah. 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 So, this was Sodom. Now, the, the history of this area talks about Sodom, later known as Bridgeton. Now, the Miller built the first bridge. In a lot of cases, the Millers would build the first bridge because it's kind of his driveway, and he's got people over there with heavy loads. Oh, sure. So in 1849, the Miller raised up some holes off of his wooden, he had a wooden dam, raised up some holes, nailed some planks, and put railings up, called Wagon Bridge. The Miller also gets the first post office in 1849, which was probably in the mill. And they said, what's the name of your town? Well, he didn't want Sodom to get for so he named the town Bridgeton after the Duke of the Bridge. It lasted eight years in Boystown. The second bridge lasted ten years and it washed out in 1867. So the county comes in 1868 and builds the very first ever bridge right there. That's where the road was at. So the mill, they paid the miller to tear his damn bridge down and out of the way. And he rebuilt the dam down here in 1868. So this dam dates to this first covered bridge, 1868. The very next year the mill burns. Now it was about where that deck's at over there. And they moved. Uh, 25 feet downstream of the first building in 1870. So this is the new building. The new mill, 1869. So you enjoy doing this? Does it show? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a, a sure. grist mill. How did you get into it? Yeah. I had a little cabin shop and I read an article about a, 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 a mill on the east coast that made shutters for over a hundred years and was water power. A water power cabin shop wouldn't have huh? yeah. But um, Mildred, I don't think, would have sold it to me. And so I promised her that I was going to carry it. Oh, so I didn't get out of corn milk because I promised Mildred I'd go. Let's do it. Are you ready for me to turn this on? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Dad. So we're not Hi, baby girl. Power. I'll see you in a bit. I'm not going to come because then we're going to fix the water power. Hey! Now, when this was built, uh, it was built as a grist mill and a feed mill. In the olden years, it was a saw mill, grist mill, and uh, a brewery, a whiskey brewery here. Uh, they always made feed. But uh, they had two big stones in here, one up there and one over there, 48 in Frank Burr. Ten years later, roller milling was gone. Roller milling was on fast and more efficient. So they stopped using stones and used the roller milling. The roller mill stood across the back of the building back there, and it's metal rollers like this, and cracks the drain the top. It's a series of four times. Each time it goes in and goes fine and fine. In the very beginning, when they uh, started making white flour, they sifted it with silk. Silk is so fine, water would go through it and fly away. By the time they got to the last uh, roller, it was called uh, a so what is that spinning now? Yeah. That, that's a uh, pastry flour coming out now. Yeah, but underneath your Oh, that's the, the, that's the pulley that runs the stone, the okay. upper stone. Okay. Yeah. Now originally that would have been wooden gear, but today uh, we're going to Naturally white, soft, soft wheat flour. Soft wheat flour. Meat. Very neat. You can throw it where you want it. There you go.
Now that's a uh, 48 inch French burr. As you probably know, that means the stone came from France. It's freshwater quartz, which means it's harder than glass. It has an estimated life of 300 years. If I tell people this was just out of warranty, it's only 200 years old. How often do you have a sharpen? Uh, we got it dressed by the head miller from Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, when we were after bought the place because I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and then we went 12 years before we had to dress it. From what I've read, granite, which was probably the most common stone around here, we had to be dressed three to four times a year. Yeah. With a French bird, you could go five to six years. Because it's right. so hard. It's so hard. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, and as you probably know, I found this in the building. The building. Uh, now, I got the grooves called furrows. Right. And you know, it slices it. When it gets dull, you start, it gets to build up a lot of friction and heat. The stone starts expanding, and you start smelling the scorching flour. But keep your nose to the grindstone. Right. Well, then you got to take it apart, and you, you take this and you tap that edge, you break it off like breaking glass. It makes it razor sharp. Then you also do this edge, so when it comes around, it actually slices it a little bit. Flat part of your land, that's where it's ground, and it falls into the furrow where it's sliced. In. Now, the first guy that dressed it used a carbide chisels. Uh, and he poured the chisels down to all this stuff. Well, that this is harder than carbide. Um, but I've traveled to a lot of mills and I've asked a lot of questions and they've all told me the same thing. Use a diamond plate. You know, for, because if you crack those stone, you can burn it. Uh, so that's what I use today. Now up around the eye, up around the center, I still use uh, this to, to tap it. You know, I can knock off chunks of rock that big. How? With the diamond blade, just beep, 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 beep. You know, it's, it's really beat. Fun, huh? For you to do that, see, I would be scared that I'd break it, chip it out. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm always, I'm always, uh, I, it, you know, it says it takes two or three days, maybe a week. What well, takes me like a month? Because I'm just, oh, I'm I just imagine. scared to death. Two hundred years old, you know. Oh, I know. Screw the whole thing up, you know. And, and it's ready to go for what? Would you say another three hundred years? Until oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. This is probably good for a thousand years. 